And this is the faithful remnant who braves minus a million to come to church. Cameron suggested that when, you know, when, when I'm near the 10-minute mark to the close, he's like, let us all know because then we can all beep, 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 and start our cars <laughs> so that we're not frozen. But I'm glad that you joined us and that you're uh, watching online. Uh, thank you for tuning in as well. Uh, if you brought a Bible, I'll encourage you. You can go to uh, the book of John. And we're going to be in chapter 4 this morning. Uh, we wrapped up our Advent series uh, on Christmas Eve, and it was just a great, uh, I heard from lots of you, it was just, that's exactly what we needed. And I think, you know, praise God, because I, I shared that, that, you know, a week or two before Advent, I was like, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. What is, what, God, what do you want us to focus on this year? And God is just very faithful, and so we spent four weeks talking about hope uh, but now we're back in the Gospel of John, and so usually our practice as a church is we just preach through books of the Bible, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and so we started the Gospel of John back in September, and so we're going to be back in there for the foreseeable future. But I just wanted to remind us, you know, what is John's purpose for writing his Gospel Right, We have four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each Gospel writer uh, kind of either had a different audience or a different approach to what, was, what were they trying to communicate, right? When we looked through the Gospel of Matthew for a few years, Matthew very clearly was trying to depict to his audience, Jesus is the Messiah, the King. He's the one who was promised, and so we're not left to guess. John tells us what is the purpose of him writing his gospel. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he tells us, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, here's why, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John says, they're, they're, Jesus did way more signs than are written down here, but he says, the reason I've written these down for you is so that you'll know that Jesus is the Son of God, that you'll believe in him, and you'll have life in his name. That is the goal of John's gospel. So right before Advent, uh, Corlin walked us through the first chunk of John chapter 4, which is famously, right, we, most of us know this story, Jesus and the woman at the well, this Samaritan woman who meets Jesus at the well, and then they begin to have this conversation about water. And if you remember, Jesus is kind of talking on a spiritual level, living water, and the woman is, you know, trying to wrap her mind around that. And, and, and then at the end, she says, basically, well, I know the Messiah is coming, and he'll kind of tell us all of these things. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he, revealing, like, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Messiah that you're waiting for. Now, here's what's interesting. Four times, you know, three we've seen already and one in our passage this morning, we see people's spiritual blindness. And here's what I mean. Jesus, in John chapter 2, he's talking to some people and he says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And he's not talking physically, right? He's not talking about the physical temple. He means his own body, his death and resurrection. But how do the people respond? They go, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. What are you talking about? Right? So that they don't clue in with what Jesus means. Then in John chapter 3, Jesus sits down with a man named uh, Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, am I supposed to go back inside my mother's womb? This makes no sense. But Jesus wasn't talking about a physical birth. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And then even uh, in John chapter 4, like I said, Jesus is talking about living water and the woman responds by saying well you don't have anything to draw water up from the well how are you going to get water right she's not cluing in that Jesus doesn't mean physical water he's talking about spiritual water and then even in our text uh, uh, today in verse 31 uh, the disciples are trying to get Jesus to eat eat rabbi and he goes I have food that you don't know anything about and I love it the disciples go did someone bring him food when we weren't here? Because they're not thinking, oh, okay, he's talking spiritually. So John is doing this on purpose because he's showing us, by and large, the majority of people in that day were spiritually blind. 
And that's why so often they, you, you, and we'll notice as we get into chapter 5 and 6 and 7, people were confused by the things that Jesus said because he was talking about spiritual things. So our passage this morning, we're, we're going to pick up right after the woman and Jesus finish talking. And, and we're going to look at the second half of the story when the disciples return and then the whole Samaritan village comes out to see Jesus. But I, I want to back up a few verses. Let's start reading uh, John chapter 4 and we'll begin in verse 25. Just the very tail end of this conversation. It says this, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast." The reading of God's word. So you, you may have noticed that the, the text is kind of broken into three sections. There's the account of the woman who she goes back to the town and she has this conversation with the people there. And then it jumps back to this interact, interaction between Jesus and his disciples. And then it, it shows us the result of the woman's testimony and Jesus staying in that town for a couple of days. So right after Jesus tells the woman that he's the Messiah in verse 26, it's like immediately, verse 27, it says, just then his disciples came back. And what's fascinating about that is that you see the sovereignty of, of God in this, right? Or, or we talk about God's providence, that he, he is ruling over everything. Nothing happens in history that's outside of his control because you go, okay, his disciples came immediately when they were done talking and the woman was still there and they were able to interact and, and have this back and forth and you go, okay, God is clearly working in this situation. And so the disciples come back and it says that they marveled that he was talking with a woman. And for us, in our day and age, we go, why, why would you marvel at that? Who cares that he's talking with a woman? But we have to understand culturally not all Jewish thought, but the majority of Jewish thought held that for a rabbi, a teacher, which is what Jesus is, for him to talk with a woman, they called it at best a waste of time. So sorry, ladies, but that, is the, that was the culture of the day. They said, you know what, rabbis shouldn't waste their time talking with women. They should just talk with men. Their culture was quite misogynistic. And they just thought that, you know, women can't understand those things anyways. Rabbis, don't waste your time. That's why the disciples come back and they go, Jesus, our rabbi, is talking with a woman. He's kind of going against the grain of what most rabbis did. But here's what you'll notice as you read the Gospels. Jesus treated women differently 
than the vast majority of the people in his day and age. You think about the interactions that Jesus had with women. Mary Magdalene, the woman who, had, who was bent over for 18 years and Jesus heals her. The, the Syrophoenician woman. Mary and Martha, the widow with the two coins. Do you remember in Matthew, the woman who reached out and touched his garment, who had been bleeding for 12 years? And you see Jesus' interaction with women, and it was vastly different than the culture of the day. Jesus loved and respected and treated women with dignity. And and that's why the disciples, it kind of doesn't fit their worldview. They're kind of marveling at, well, why would Jesus talk with a woman? No less a Samaritan woman, right? Because, I mean, Corlin unpacked that a little bit, but the Jews hated Samaritans and vice versa, right? Samaritans were kind of seen as um, half-breeds, and it's offensive, but that's how they, they were Jews who intermingled with other uh, ethnicities, and so they weren't even pure Jewish people, and so they looked down on Samaritans, and so here's a Samaritan and a woman, and Jesus is talking with her, treating her with dignity and respect. Now, notice what the disciples didn't ask, right? It tells us, no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? And the implication is that they wanted to ask, but they didn't dare ask, right? They, they, they wanted to ask Jesus, Jesus, why were you talking with her? Or ask the woman, what are you seeking? Why are you talking to our teacher, our leader? And so we're told then that the woman leaves the water jar, she goes back into town, and this is what she tells uh, the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And the way that it's worded is that in the original language, that, that question, can this be the Christ, is worded in a way that expects a negative answer. So what I mean by that is if we would translate it a little bit better, it would say, he isn't the Christ, is he? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expression of cautious faith. This can't, this can't be the Christ. Could it be? Could it be? Now, why? Why would she word it like that, expecting a negative response? Because if you read back, you read all of John 4, it seems like this woman has a very powerful conversation and experience with Jesus, but now she's kind of wording it in the negative, he isn't the Christ, is he? Now, here's why. This is really fascinating. In verse 28, when it says, uh, she went away into the town and said to the people... That word, people, is uh, a masculine word in the Greek language. There's different words for people or human or humanity. And this word is the masculine form of that word. And it's most often translated as men or males. And so here's what most scholars think. That the woman left and went to Sakaar, her town in Samaria. And she got to the front gate. And that is where all the men in the city used to... In most cities, the men would sit at the front gate and they would just talk and debate and reason with one another. And so most scholars think that this woman actually just went to the men. Even though it says people, it's the masculine form of that word. And so this woman goes to the men in the front gate. And I think because of her reputation, remember she's been married five times. The man that she's living with now is not even her husband. She had a reputation in that town. Most scholars think, even with the cultural views around men and women, that she words it that way because she is inviting the men to come and investigate themselves. Because, like, think about it. If a woman who had a terrible reputation in that culture just came and said, hey, I met the Messiah, come and see, the men of that town would go, she's crazy. Why would we listen to her? Do you know her reputation? But she comes and she says, come see a man who knew everything about me. This couldn't be the Christ, could it? She's smart. Because the men go, well, let's go see, right? She's, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Let's go see. This woman is smart. And so the town, and I think specifically the men of the town come out and they're on their way. Verse 30, they went out of the town and they were coming to him. And then we jump right back, right? Verse 31. Meanwhile, so while this is happening, Jesus is having a a, a discussion with his disciples. 
And I love that the disciples are urging him to eat, which makes sense. That's why they went into town. If you remember in the back, or in the front of, uh, of John 4, right at the beginning, it says that, uh, that his disciples went away to find food. Right? Verse 8, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So they come back with food, and they're urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus then says one of those spiritual statements that confuses everybody. I have food to eat that you don't know about. And the disciples then are saying to one another, did somebody bring him something to eat? Isn't that great? I, the disciples give me such hope for myself. I'm like, okay, they weren't the smartest, so I think I'm okay. But they say, like, it makes sense, logically. Okay, we left to go to town because Jesus was weary and he needed some food. We have the food now, and now he says, well, I have food that you don't know about. So logically, it makes sense. Someone else brought him food. But look at what Jesus says in verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't need physical food. Jesus was fully human. We know that he ate and that he drank, that he got tired, he was weary. So it's not as if Jesus is saying, oh, no, no, foolish humans, I don't need food. That's not what he's saying. But the great aim and object of Jesus' life was not to cater to the body, but rather the great aim and object of his life was he was there to do the will of God. That's why he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, God the Father. So what was the will of God for Jesus? And again, John tells us later on, John 6, 39 at 40, this is what Jesus says, this is the will of him who sent me. That I should lose nothing of all that he's given to me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Even in John 12, Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. The will of Jesus, when he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, the will of Jesus was eternal life, right? That he would come and that he would die and that he would give eternal life and that he would raise people up on the last day. That is the will of Jesus. So when he says, I have, my, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, what he means is my mind and my, I'm focused on eternal life. I'm focused on giving eternal life to people. That's what sustains me. Even though Jesus was tired, thirsty, probably hungry, he appears to have been refreshed and reinvigorated through his conversation with the woman. And now the whole town is coming out to hear him. And so he's accomplishing his father's will, eternal life. And he's like, that is what sustains me. Right, I know that even if you've ever fasted before, which is a spiritual discipline that not a lot of people do, myself included, but if you've ever fasted before, abstained from food, physical eating, right, and, and during those times you've had times of prayer and uh, reading scripture and worship, you've probably noticed the same thing, that your body's really hungry, but then you go into a time of prayer, and you go into a time of worship, and it's like God sustains you, and you forget about your, your hunger. I think that's a little bit of what Jesus is saying. He says, no, my, my food is to proclaim eternal life, and I've just done that with the woman at the well, and so I feel refreshed and reinvigorated. Um, it reminds me, and most likely Jesus is thinking of Deuteronomy 8.3, when, when uh, it says this, he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And that probably sounds familiar because when Jesus was tempted by Satan, hey, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8, man does not live by bread alone. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm not focused on food. I'm focused on the will of God, which is proclaiming eternal life. And then he goes on. Jesus says, "Um, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Lift your eyes. The fields are white for harvest. 
And then he says, you know, the one who is reaping is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. The sower and the reaper are rejoicing together. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you didn't labor. Others have labored and you've entered into their labor. So now Jesus is kind of using this farming, agricultural illustration, but he's still talking spiritually, right? And I'm sure the disciples were like, I'm trying to follow your line of thinking here, Jesus. But, he, but he, what he says is, you know, there's four months and then the harvest. And that was often common, right? The, the, the farmers would plant in that uh, part of the world, usually in December, January, somewhere uh, uh, along that. And then usually it was four to five months and then they would harvest what they had planted. And so when Jesus says, like, do you not say there's yet four months and then comes the harvest? That was probably a common saying in that day and age because physically speaking, that's exactly what happens. In the physical world, there is a gap between the time where you sow and you reap, right? Many of you farm and you know that you don't sow the, the seed and then the next day you reap. It doesn't work like that. You have, you have to give time in the physical world but what jesus is saying is that's not how it works in the spiritual world samaritans are right now right as jesus and the disciples are talking the, the whole town of sakar so the samaritans are coming out to meet him right so think about what jesus is saying he's saying i just spent some time sowing right with the samaritan woman planting seeds of eternal life and then he goes, and look, already the harvest is here. And, and lots of scholars think that when, when Jesus says, the fields are white for harvest, look, lift your eyes, he was looking at the crowds of Samaritans coming to him, saying, look, already, right? I just sowed the seeds of eternal life with the Samaritan woman, already, look at the harvest that's here. Lift your eyes. We don't have to wait, right? We can reap right now. In Jesus' kingdom, what he's saying is that there doesn't have to be a wait time between sowing and reaping, right? He says, already the one who reaps, receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life. He says, the sower and the reaper are rejoicing together. If you remember when we went through the book of Amos, Amos 9.13 says a similar thing, talking about the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. It says this, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Amos saw a day coming when like sower and reaper just worked together. That like they, the, the one who sowed was being overtaken by the one coming right behind him, reaping immediately. And so now Jesus is saying the same thing. In my kingdom, we sow and we reap. We don't have to wait four months. This is the glorious messianic age the kingdom of god has begun sowers and reapers rejoicing together you sow the gospel you reap immediately now when he says others have labored and you've entered into that labor what does he mean well one the disciples had nothing to do with the samaritan woman the great harvest that was going to happen as the samaritans come out they they weren't involved in any of that sowing work Right? Others labored, meaning probably including the Old Testament writers, the prophets, John the Baptist, the Samaritan woman, Jesus himself. They've all labored by sowing. And then he says, and now you are gonna, uh, you're, you're entering into that labor. You didn't even do this. And now, look, the Samaritans are coming out and you're going to have a harvest. And then we, we jump in verse 39 back to the Samaritan. It's, it says, many Samaritans believed in him. Because of the woman's testimony. And they asked Jesus to stay with them, and he did for two whole days. And it says, many more believed because of his word. So whatever Jesus taught them in those two days, many, many more believed because of his words. And then they actually said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said. We've heard ourselves. Now, they're not disparaging the woman's words. They're not saying like, yeah, 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 we don't have to listen to you anymore. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is that your words have now been verified because we've heard it from Jesus ourselves. We don't have to believe because of, of your testimony. We believe because we heard from him. We heard from Jesus. And the Samaritan conclusion about Jesus, this town, Sakar, this is their conclusion 
at the end of verse 42, we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Notice that the Samaritans don't say, this is indeed the Savior of the Jews. They said, this is the Savior of the world. Already, right, in their minds, Jesus has come for Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans. So notice, notice the, the trajectory. The tra- that's a hard word. Notice how, how far we've come, right? Verse 27, could this be the Christ? This, this can't be the Christ. Could it be? And they come out and see, and then verse 42, this is indeed the Savior of the world. So it's quite an amazing interaction. Basically, a whole town experiences revival. The town of Sakar, Samaritans, and again, I want to remind you, these were, these were the outcasts. They were despised by Jews. Oftentimes, people, Jewish people wouldn't even travel through Samaria. They would actually go the long way around because they hated Samaritans. Uh, this is why when Jesus um, tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, that's why it's so shocking. Because the hero of the story, the story is a Samaritan. And the Jews listening would have gone, no. They're the ones who would have beaten up the guy, not take care of him. And so here we have an entire city of Samaritans responding to Jesus and believing in him. So the first point to pull out from this passage, I think, is how the Samaritans responded. That claim that they made at at the end of verse 42. This is indeed the Savior of the world. And for us reading it, it seems fairly obvious because if you're a follower of Jesus, we would probably all say that. Yep, Jesus is the Savior of the world. But it's quite an exclusive claim that the Samaritans make. And it's used actually, that that phrase about Jesus specifically, this is indeed the Savior of the world. It's used here in John 4 and it's also used one other time in 1 John 4:14 4, where it says and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Um in the old testament God himself was the one who saved his people. I mean obviously right we know that if, if specifically the greatest instance of that in the old testament was the exodus. God was their savior. He saved them from Egypt, and sometimes in the Old Testament, God was specifically called the Savior, and now his son Jesus is called the Savior of the world. And in that day and age and in that culture, numerous Greek deities were given the same title. Uh, Zeus, in in that kind of religion, was called the Savior of the world. Um, Asclepius, who was the God of healing, his title was Savior of the world, basically all the Roman emperors called themselves the savior of the world. Um, there was a, 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 a figure named Hadrian who lived 117 to 138, and his title was savior of the world. So it's not a new title. The, the people living in that day and age would have heard that title all the time. So-and-so is the savior of the world. The emperor is the savior of the world. But here come the Samaritans, and notice, right, it would have been fine for them to call Jesus a savior of the world. Yeah, the emperor is a savior of the world. And Jesus can be also a savior of the world. But the way that they say it is, is not that he is just one of many saviors. They say this is indeed the savior of the world. The only one is what it implies. Now, that would have been terribly offensive in that culture. No, no, no. The emperor, too, is a savior. But also, if you think about our culture, it's terribly offensive to make any kind of, in, like, any kind of definite, exclusive claim about anything. That's the world that we live in because we've bought into the idea in our culture of inclusivism Meaning, and what I mean by that is that our culture, because of postmodernity and because of philosophy and things, we've said, well, there's no such thing as objective truth. No one can say that they have the truth. There's no such thing as a universal truth. And what we talk about instead is, well, everyone just kind of has their version of the truth, right? What's true for you? And I just need to 
you know, find my truth. And we, anytime someone uses the word truth with my in front of it, red flag, right? Because, but that's the language that we use. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true for you, but it's not necessarily true for me. And it's considered arrogant, actually, for you to go, no, I know what the truth is. They would go, you're being arrogant. No one can claim to know the truth. I'll give you an example of how this, this plays out. And I, I may have shared this story before, but back when I was a pastor in Maple Ridge, my sister and brother-in-law went to the church that I was a pastor at, and they had uh, just one uh, child at that point, uh, Sawyer, my little nephew. And I remember after one of the services, I'm in the, the lobby, and uh, Sawyer had been down in, you know, our version of Kid Zone, down in Sunday school. And he came up, and he had chocolate all over his face, and I'm pretty sure he was even holding the, remain, the last remains of a cookie. So I said, hey, Sawyer, buddy, did you have a cookie in Sunday school? And he said, no. And in our culture, and we laugh, but in our culture, I would just have to accept that as Sawyer's truth. But what did I say? Well, you're a liar. <laughs> you clearly had a cookie. You're holding it. And there's chocolate all over your face, right? And that's a, kind of a silly example. But in our culture, what we would have to say if we're going to be consistent is go, okay, Sawyer's truth is that he didn't eat a cookie, even though he clearly did, but it's offensive for me to say that, to make that kind of a, a truth claim. That's the world that we live in. It's bonkers. It is. It's just, it's actually logically ridiculous to think like this. When we go, no, that's clearly true, well, you can't say that, right? Now, the idea of inclusivism and, you know, no objective truth now is in the, the religious arena as well because we've bought into this idea as a culture that every religion is right. Everyone's idea of truth is right and it's valid. No one has the upper hand on truth. So for Christianity and Jesus to say that Jesus and Jesus alone is the Savior of the world, well, that's not inclusive. You can't say that. Jesus is one path, right? Look, look at some of these quotes. This is what Rabbi Boliek, I might not be saying his last name right. This is what he says. I am absolutely against any religion that says one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that is anything different than spiritual racism, which doesn't make any sense anyways, <laughs> But I'm against, look, notice what he says. No religion can say that their faith is superior to another. That's off limits. Even uh, Gandhi says, my position is that all great religions fundamentally equal. The great philosopher Oprah Winfrey said this, one of the biggest, I don't know why you're laughing, one of, one of the biggest mistakes, look at what she says though, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe that there's only one way. Actually, there are many divine paths leading to God. That is the cultural norm. Whether you are a Christian, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Scientologist, whatever it is, our culture would say, you're all right. You're all, you all just have a different angle on truth. No one has the truth. And yet, look at what Jesus says. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Look at this. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not very inclusive. Jesus says, you want to come to the Father? You want eternal life? It's through me and me alone. Acts 4, 11 and 12, Peter says this. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So notice that Peter doesn't say, hey, hey, Jesus died and he was raised from the dead and he's a great path to the Father. He's a great path to salvation. Peter says, if you want salvation, it's not found anywhere else. There is no salvation in Zeus, pick any other deity you want. There's no salvation in that. There is salvation in Jesus alone. So the idea, right, the idea that everyone is right, that everyone's truth claims are equal, this idea of inclusivism, it, it actually is lunacy. 
It, it, it makes no logical sense. Like if we had on stage uh, a Buddhist and a Hindu and a Muslim and myself as a Christian and we shared what our faith traditions believe, they all contradict each other. So you can't say, well, everybody's right. We're making contradictory statements, right? And so it's just so lunacy to say that, well, no matter what you believe, everybody's right. And even, even you know, the idea you can't make a truth claim is a truth claim. Like, it's logically ridiculous to say, no, 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 no one can make a truth claim. Well, that is a truth claim. So already you've defeated your own argument, right? But as Christians, here's what we do. One, we show Christian civility, meaning we respect people of other religions. We fight for their freedom to practice their religion. Um, even we seek to learn about what do you actually believe? I'm curious. But at the same time, we actively preach Christ crucified. So as Christians, because we believe that we have the truth from Scripture about salvation, that doesn't mean that we're arrogant. That doesn't mean that we just go and we're going to bash every other faith, religion, or whatever. No, 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 no. We, we just use reason, and we, and we preach Christ crucified, and we still show civility with other religions. But God has told us that there's only one way of salvation. It's Jesus. Jesus is the Savior of the world. There's salvation in no one else. And so we have this sense of urgency among us because we go, well, people need to hear this, right? It's not enough to just say, well, I believe in a God and I'm trying to be a good person. That's not Christianity and that will not save you, right? Your salvation rests on what you do with the person of Jesus. Do you accept him or reject him? That's really the answer, for eternal life and salvation. What are you going to do with Jesus? You either accept him or you reject him. There's no kind of wiggle room in that. And so we're going to see lots through the book of John. Jesus just makes those kind of statements, very offensive statements, that he is the one way to salvation. Secondly, I think from this passage we see how salvation works in the kingdom of God. And it's actually quite exciting. Jesus says that sowing and reaping take place at the same time. So you don't just sow the gospel and then, well, now i got to wait a super long time and wait and wait and wait. Because of Jesus, Jesus says it can happen simultaneously. Right? You can sow and reap on the same day. So it means a couple of things. One, a variety of factors can bring people to Jesus. And, and I know that you know this because um, I, I know so many people that became Christians and I go, there is no cookie cutter approach to how this works. No one person can claim credit for converting someone. You know, we often talk about, oh, you know, that person so-and-so, they're a great soul winner for the kingdom. There are no soul winners in the kingdom. There's only harvesters. No one wins souls. That's the work of the Spirit. Our job is that we harvest, right? We sow and we reap. And so we see from the Samaritan woman's own testimony and then Jesus' own words, those two things played a factor in the town of Sychar experiencing revival. Like it says, many Samaritans believed because of the woman's testimony. And then later on it says, many more believed because of his word. So the woman's testimony, people believed in Jesus because of her testimony. And then later on, Jesus stays for two days and it says way more people believed after that because of his own words. And so you, say, you see, salvation happens in, in different ways in the kingdom. And so what that means for you and me is that some of us might be called to sow and some of us might be called to reap. Some of you might be called to simply sow the gospel. And then some of you might be called to reap the harvest. But the point is, who cares how people are saved as long as they're saved? Right? In the kingdom, Jesus says, sowers and reapers rejoice together. No one says, oh, you actually got to lead them to, like, to Jesus? Ah, oh, I wanted to. I'll give you an example. Like, um, when I was a, a youth pastor 
uh, the, the teens would hear me say the same thing over and over and over and over. You need to believe in Jesus. You have to believe the gospel. Let it sing into your heart. You have to follow Jesus. It's worth it, and on and on and on. And then we'd go to a retreat, and so fancy speaker so-and-so would say the exact same thing I've said, and they would all come to the front and surrender to Jesus because that was, my job wasn't to reap the harvest in that season. My job was to sow. And when I saw teens coming to know Jesus, did I sit in the back going, I wish, I, I wish they would listen to me. No, i just like, thank you, Lord. They believe the gospel, right? And so that's how the kingdom works. You might sow and you might reap, and we all rejoice in that, right? Even Paul says that, 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So Paul says, and early on he says, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? Who's Peter? Who cares? He says, I, I planted the gospel Apollos watered it, he kind of nurtured it, but God's the one who gives the growth. So in the kingdom of God, we're not comparing like, okay, well, well, you've led so-and-so to Christ, and I've only led four people to Christ. No, anytime someone surrenders to Jesus, we all rejoice. It doesn't matter if you sowed or reaped, we just go, thank you, Lord. The harvest is plentiful. This is amazing. So our job as followers of Jesus then, as we do life and as we proclaim Christ crucified as the only way to salvation, our job is just to just be faithful. Like Jesus, I love that Jesus doesn't put a quota, right? You got to lead 100 people to, to me to know that you're serious. He, he never says that. What's your job? Be faithful. Faithfully share the gospel day in and day out, week in and week out, and God says, I, I'll save who I'm going to save, and it's in my timing. And what do you and I do? We rejoice. Doesn't that, doesn't that just take the pressure off? That yes, we care. And many of you, I know that you just weep over lost people that you know. And we care about our neighbors. But if you bear the burden that it's my job to save them, it will crush you. Your job is not to save your neighbors or your family members or your coworkers. What is your job? Be faithful. Share the gospel live it out, tell people about Jesus, and then rejoice when God does his work. That fact is actually incredibly comforting because it takes the pressure. I don't have to be anyone's savior. I just share the gospel and I sow, and then if I get to reap, amazing, and we rejoice and God gets all the glory. So Father, I just thank you for your word and what an encouragement it is. Um, God, I think it's so fitting that on our last Sunday of the year, kind of looking back and then looking forward to the future of whatever 2022 will hold for us, to just be reminded that, God, the harvest is plentiful. Um, you still desire to save people, and you still save people. And our job is not to bear the burden of being clever enough or um, creative enough, or just good enough with our words. Our job is not to, 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 to kind of have it all figured out so that we can save people. Our job is simply to be faithful, to faithfully live out the gospel that we believe, to faithfully share that you and you alone, Jesus, are the only means of salvation. Our job is to sow and to reap but God, you are the one that gives the growth. You are the one that saves people. And so I just pray as we, we think back on this last year, God, I pray that even today or this week as we reflect and think, God, help us to see areas that we've sown and maybe even reaped and help us to see and celebrate and rejoice when we've seen fruit and a harvest from that. 
And then as we think ahead to this next year, God, I pray too that we would just be resolved. You know what? This year, I just want to be faithful to share what I believe. I want to be faithful to to learn the gospel myself and learn how to share it with others. I want to be faithful to sow and to reap. And God, we ask that in 2022, we would see a great harvest Um, in our town, in this northern peace region. God, we just ask that as we faithfully sow and, and reap, God, would you bring a harvest God, I pray that 2022 would just be a year of much rejoicing in what you have done. And so just thank you for this example of this little town in Samaria who heard the testimony of the most unlikely person, probably the the woman in town who had the worst reputation, who heard her testimony and then Jesus heard your very own words and many, many people believed. And so just thank you for the encouragement that, that that is. And so we just ask that you would do the same in our town, Jesus, and just strengthen us for this next year. And so thank you again for your word and how faithful you are to to speak to us through it. And I just pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.